Well, hello and uh, welcome to the latest edition of the Homan Academy. Today, I'm absolutely blown away to be able to introduce to you Robert Zubrin. Robert Zubrin is an aerospace engineer, uh, perhaps best known for his, his huge advocacy and expertise for why we should be going to Mars. So Robert, welcome to the Homan Academy podcast. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure, sir. It's a pleasure. Where, where, are, we, where are we speaking to you today from? I'm uh, in Lakewood, Colorado, which is near Denver. Near Denver. I've been to Denver. Yeah, I've been to Denver. That's one part of it. Have you ever been to, to London or to the Cots or to Oxford? Yes, uh, I, I have. I've been to London uh, three or four times. And uh, once I even went around the UK, I went to Wales and to Scotland as well. Oh, very good. Well, you'll understand my accent, hopefully. Yes, Scottish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had a, I was speaking to a lady last week who was a professor of psychology in New York and she thought I was Irish, um, which made my mum and dad laugh. <laughs> so let's, let's just jump straight in, uh, Robert. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about what it is you do at the moment? What's your focus uh, at the moment in your, in your work? Okay, well, I actually make a living as an aerospace engineer. Uh, I... Um, own and run a small aerospace research and development company called Pioneer Astronautics. In fact, I'm speaking to you from my office. And uh, we do uh, research and development on contract, mostly for NASA, sometimes for others. Mm -hmm. um, we've done about 70 NASA contracts. Wow. Uh, so that's, that's how I earn a living. Um, and, and we've done all sorts of work uh, in all areas of space technology, but most especially uh, what NASA calls in situ resource utilization and what I call local resource creation, because okay. uh, I don't think that there's any such thing as natural resources anywhere. I think there's only natural raw materials. It's resourceful people that yeah. turn materials into resources. Well, I love that. And uh, so anyway, we've done a lot of that because um, I believe that that is the key to the uh, exploration and development and settlement of space um, is the ability to turn the materials there into resources. That is what defines an environment as being habitable or not. And then, of course, I, I do run a nonprofit called Mars Society that promotes uh, Mars exploration. And we're having our next convention is going to be an international teleconvention. Um, but therefore, people in the UK can participate just as well as people in the United States or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And um, that's going to be in October, and it's free, and oh, people can register for it at marssociety.org. Um, and I'm also the author of a number of books, of which the most recent is The Taste of Space. And um, if I could, uh, I mean, I actually spotted you on television recently on National Geographic on their series Mars. What was that experience like? Well, um, they actually interviewed me twice, uh, mm -hmm. once for the first season, the second for the second season. Uh, they used a lot of the material that I did for the first season. I don't think very much for the second. Um, but it was interesting um, because they had, you know, that, that series was, uh, they had a dramatic plot that takes place in the future with a group of explorers on Mars. Yes. And then they had people like me who are, uh, have some degree of expertise in this who live in the now, which is to say in the past relative to the story, yes. uh, commenting on what they think is going on. And it reminded me in a way of, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Reds about the Russian Revolution. Yes, yes. And in that movie, the story occurs in the past, and they have a variety of people. This movie was made in 1980, but people like Rebecca West were still around in 1980 and who knew John Reed and Louise Bryant and so forth that, and the other uh, people who were living during the Russian Revolution and they were talking about it. So there you had, as it were, the future talking about the past and here we had the past talking about the future. <laughs> and I have to ask this question, how, how uh, I mean, I know we can't talk about facts, but how, how accurate do you think their depiction of the, the future settlement in Mars uh, somewhat, um, I, you know, all these things, well, the National Geographic series and also, for instance, the movie The Martian, yeah. um, there's technical inaccuracies one can pick out. But both of those projects, I would commend for having a spirit of realism. 
That is, there might be particular technical inaccuracies, but it wasn't a fantasy movie. Yeah. Um, like, you know, Total Recall has no relationship to reality. Yeah. And, yeah. and other movies that are about Mars are really just shoot 'em ups or horror pictures or something. These were actually dealing with the question of um, the exploration or settlement of Mars. And, and that's something new. I'm still waiting for the great Mars movie because I don't think we either of these qualify. Uh, you know, The Martian was a very good movie, but there was a problem with it, which is that the character was not interested in Mars. Yes. Um, <laughs> so it, it was a great, you know, s story about human uh, courage and resiliency and the Kansi spirit is all great stuff, but it wasn't really fully about Mars. It didn't have the wonder of Mars. And, you know, a movie that I really like is the first Jurassic Park movie. And the reason why I really like that one is that it not only showed the terror of the dinosaurs, it was also the wonder of the dinosaurs. Yes. yes. And, uh, and that's what made that movie great uh, in comparison to the sequels. And, uh, but that, that's what the Martian needed. It needed both the danger of Mars, but also the wonder. I think I might come back to one that I didn't expect that. I, I, I'll come back to that, Robert, if you don't mind. But I, I have to, I have to go straight to the to the quick here, as you say, in the UK. Um, why do you think that our listeners should be interested and care about human beings going to Mars? Why? Well, okay. There's, you know, two reasons that you hear from the space agencies about Mars, and they're valid. Uh, one is the science, um, you know, and the other is the challenge. Mars is um, the Rosetta Stone for telling us the truth about the potential prevalence and diversity of life in the universe. The early Mars is very similar to the early Earth. Yeah. And so if the theory is true that life evolves wherever it can, then it should have uh, appeared on Mars. And we could find, and, and, and since we now know that most stars have planets, if life evolves wherever it can, it means life's everywhere. Um, but furthermore, we'd be able to find out, if we do find life on Mars, whether it is um, the same or fundamentally different. Uh, see, all, all Earth life is fundamentally the same at the genetic level, at the information level. It all uses DNA and RNA. That's the alphabet of life. Okay, now, okay, we speak. English, uh, albeit with different accents, but same language, and the French and the Spanish and the Germans uh, use the same alphabet, um, and the Russians use a different alphabet, but it works on the same principles as our alphabet, mm -hmm. but the Chinese have a completely different alphabet that works on a completely different set of principles. It has a totally separate origin, okay, and uh, it's a completely different information system. Both the language and the alphabet are completely different information systems. It's not just different information. It's a different system of information. Mm -hmm. And so all life on Earth uses the same information system, but is that true of life in the universe? Yes. Okay, does everybody use the Latin alphabet or are some using Chinese? Yes. Um, we could find out. This is really something that people have wondered about for thousands of years, and, and, and the place of life in the universe. If life is just only on the Earth, then life is a very peripheral role in the universe. Yeah. But if life's everywhere, it means life's a major player in the universe. Maybe life is in the process of dominating the universe as life dominates the Earth. Yes. Um, and the then there's the challenge, uh, humans to Mars program. Uh, it's a tremendous challenge, and challenge is a positive thing. Um, especially to youth. The youth loves adventure. This would make science a great adventure. Yes. Uh, Humans to Mars program would be an invitation to intellectual adventure to every young person learning their science. You could be a pioneer of new worlds. Out of that, we get millions of scientists, engineers, inventors, technological entrepreneurs, doctors, medical researchers. And, you know, this intellectual capital, this is the basis of our prosperity. It's the basis of our military strength is a basis of our ability to defend ourselves against diseases. Uh, and uh, the, you, would, you could, couldn't find a better driver. But I think that, and, and so these are, are true reasons that are offered by the official space agencies, uh, but I think there's an additional reason. And the additional reason is 
the fundamental question of whether we have an open future or a closed future. Okay. And this question, and, it, 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 and, and yes, okay, that there should be a grand future with humans and spacefaring species with thousands of planets and thousands of cultures and literatures and, and traditions of invention and, and all of this on, on, on numerous planets. That's something grand. And when you, if you have the capacity to create something grand, then you should. But it's more urgent than that because how we conceive of our future will control how we deal with the present. And if it is believed, well, let me put it to this. What is the main threat to humanity today? Mm. What is it that is it placed us, us at risk? Is it climate change and resource exhaustion? Uh, well, these things have some validity, but they were certainly not the cause of the major disasters of the 20th century. Yeah. Okay. The major disasters of the 20th century were not caused by stuff like that. They were caused by bad ideas. Yeah. And in particular, one bad idea, which is that there isn't enough for everyone. Right. Okay. There okay. isn't enough to go around. And so we are going to have to take it from them. Okay. And if they're threatening to become too strong, we have to knock them down because otherwise they will become strong enough to take it from us. Yes. And this idea in several different forms, but at bottom, the same idea, is the root cause of the world wars, of the Holocaust, the Holodomor, and, and, and it, 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 all sorts of horrors. And it threatens to be uh, the cause of worse in the 21st century. Uh, and, but if you understand that it is not true that there's only so much to go around, because what there is to go around is dependent upon human creativity. And the more creative people and the more creative nations that are taking part in this grand enterprise of opening the human prospect, the more there is going to be for everyone. Okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is demonstrably true in a way. I mean, the population of the world has gone up and the standard of living has gone up, not down, exactly the opposite of what Malthus said. Okay, yeah. and, and, and it hasn't just gone up a little, it's gone up a lot. Uh, and um, the, 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 but nevertheless, somehow it seems that it must be true. There's only so much land. There's only so much this. Germany needs living space, blah, blah. Yeah. Nonsense, but it seems like it's true. Uh, but if we can show that it's not, show it in the most tangible way, by showing that there's an open universe for us if we work yeah. together we can wow. have the grand future and not the horrible future. Yes. I mean, that opens up a whole range of, of supplementary questions. So if you don't mind, I'll, 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 the, 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 sort of the, the first thing that comes to mind, um, I remember Carl Sagan saying, you know, his greatest fear was that, and he was talking about America, and I think you probably know where I'm going here, his greatest fear that you would have a society underpinned and based on engineering and scientific principles, but where no one understands those principles. Um, and I, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, but maybe in, you don't have to, but maybe in the context of the response to COVID, um, because there hasn't been an awful lot of, um, well, questionable responses to COVID across the world, not just in America. Um, right. But um, do you think that, you know, is this, I mean, I, I, my personal view is it's, all, it's in it, we have to go, because if we don't go, you know, we won't be able to deal with things like COVID in the future because COVID is only a, I mean, we're very lucky in many ways with COVID, as you know. Um, but um, it, what do you think about that? Is, 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 could that perhaps give us more leverage to see uh, more people getting behind your ideas about space exploration? Well, okay, once again, um, science isn't facts in a textbook. Science is an attitude. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. a rational attitude, uh, one of investigation, questioning, rationally thinking through solutions, seeing what's true and what's not true. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there have been cases in history, late Roman Empire, uh, certain periods in China, when civilizations no longer were able to do what they used to do. Yeah. Okay. When they lost hold of, 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 of those traditions that made them great. In fact, 
the, the you know the real definition of decadence isn't um, well everybody's going to you know pornographic parties and so forth although that could be part of a decadent society yeah. it's when a society loses hold of the principle that allowed it to be born grow and prosper right. when it loses hold of its generative principle okay okay mm -hmm. now the generative principle of western civilization is rationalism it is the belief that the human mind has the capacity to understand the universe and that if i mean sometimes get it wrong for sure but if we think hard enough if we look hard enough we can find out the truth yes okay that there is truth to be discovered and that we can find it out and um and that's an attitude and it's the attitude that's led to technological progress it's the attitude that's what led to uh improved systems of justice and looking for what is right okay trying to figure that out um natural um, natural law and science, natural law and society. And, uh, and yeah, sure, there have been irrational uh, responses. Um, and I think, frankly, a lot of magical thinking uh, going on right now. Yeah, um, sure. And, uh, of course, um, Trump is pretty nutty, but the, the, the response of his opponents are equally irrational, thinking they can just print money and we don't need to go to work. We'll just keep paying people not to work uh, and so forth. That, you know, personally, um, I think moves to impose quarantine were well taken, but they can't go on forever. And that once you're in quarantine, you're in a race against time to create mass testing abilities so that you can release people and then re-quarantine only those who are infected. Uh, it, right now in the United States, okay, we've been in quarantine for almost two months now, and so it's, it's breaking down, but there's been no move to create the kind of, of mass testing programs that are required. Yes. Uh, you know, we bought two months, <laughs> it did cost us trillions of dollars, but, but we didn't, um, um, uh, do what was necessary. So you've got these two different forms of magical thinking. On the right, the idea, well, well, we'll just pretend it's not there. And on the left, well, we can just print money and, 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 and not have to work. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, sure. And then, but of course, now who are we depending on right now to find these answers uh, to create um, quick mass testing kits to create vaccines or cures, treatments. Well, it's this scientific uh, apparatus that has been created, millions of, 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 of biologists and medical researchers and, 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 and all the rest. Uh, and, uh, you know, and mm -hmm. I think, well, frankly, I think they are going to succeed at, at a certain point. There, there will be cost both in lives and treasure along the way but I think we can beat this damn virus but it's because we are a society that has um, invested in science and by investing in science that doesn't mean just investing in laboratories it means promoting science and promoting a scientific attitude and, and, and scientific education yes. uh, and the, 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 in the population at large. This is what is going to make us defensible. This is why, I mean, one thing that we have seen, look, when, if you read about the bubonic plague hitting Europe in the 1300s, people thought it was the end of the world. Yeah. People uh, and societies broke down and people thought that this was God punishing us for sin and so forth. And it, it created terror. Okay, in 1918, you didn't have that kind of terror because people did understand that diseases were not divine punishments, but they were caused by germs. So you didn't have this kind of mass terror, or, but you nevertheless didn't have a mature medical science that was able to come up with a cure or a vaccine. Um, the, 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 and the quarantine measures weren't inadequate. Um, the, the, this time around, I think we're going to do better. So to the extent that we are no longer living in terror from these things, 
this is because of science. That's an interesting reframe. I hadn't heard anyone putting it that way before. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, can I? That leads me to another area that I, I I think we need to think about, and I would love your advice on it. Um, we seem to be having um, growth in three things at the moment uh, at exponential rates. There's artificial intelligence, there's biotech, and there's nanotech. And people are getting interested in that, whether that's for commercial reasons or whatever, but they are getting interested. Now, there are some bubbles of interest in other types of science, like space technologies. It's starting to happen. My hypothesis here, and I, I might be wrong, and obviously you tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think one of the issues is that, that scientists, and I'm a former scientist, but you know, we, are not, we are not as good at communicating as we should be. Um, have you any thoughts on that, but also a supplementary for the scientists in our community who are listening to this? What advice would they give them to you? Because I mean, I, I, the, the, if anyone hasn't read this book, this is uh, Robert's latest book, The Case for Space. It is a technical book, but it's easy to read. It is a lovely book, sir. So well done. It's a, it's a terrific book. And I've got markers all over it because I think it's fascinating. But you, you seem to have stepped across that Rubicon, you know, and there's not many names that you're there with, in my opinion, you know, the, certainly not contemporary names. Um, so uh, what, what do you think? I mean, what do you think about that as a challenge? Well, it is, and um, I think it's an important challenge for people who are actively engaged in science to convey uh, not just the facts, but the adventure, or the excitement of it. If you convey the excitement and the adventure, then people will go and learn the facts. Yeah. Um, you know, I think um, that the way science is taught, um, you know, on one hand, it's a great success story. We, graduate millions of scientists. But on the other hand, uh, I, I think it could certainly be improved. And one of the things that um, I would introduce into science classes is debates. Okay. For instance, right. I mean, because real scientists are always in debate. Science yeah. is never settled, okay? Yeah. Uh, you know. It's never finished, um, is it? You never say, well, I'm finished with physics. We'll move on to biology now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, you know, Viking landed on Mars, and there were three experiments that were for life detection that gave what could be interpreted as positive signals, and there's one that uh, gave what would have to be interpreted as a negative signal. And the scientists debated each other as to, you know, how to sort this out. I'd like to have a high school debate on that with different sides taking, there, it discovered life, it proved there was no life. Then you come to grips with the matter, okay? Uh, Instead of teaching the Big Bang, how about debating it? Uh, <laughs> you know, um, and uh, because there's a lot of questions there. Yeah. So what about this multiverse stuff? Oof. Okay, how about free will? Um, you know, um, they, 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 these questions, uh, these are grand questions. Yeah. Uh, okay, Darwin, natural selection, natural selection is tautologically true, with things that don't work do get eliminated, but where do the creative uh, uh, innovations in evolution come from? Okay, yes. uh, and the, 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 you know, so if people debated them, if students debated them, they'd have an understanding of, 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 of really come to grips with what science is all about. Wow, um, I love that, and I mean, that, 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 and I said I would come back to it. Um, I, I, I read, in, not a lot, but there's the, you see it in the scientific literature quite a lot about wonder, that word wonder that you use yeah. right at the start of our conversation. What is that and, 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 and why do you think it's important for our listeners to think about wonder in their lives? Big question, okay. sorry. <laughs> well, there's a lot there to wonder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is this fantastic universe that we live in and how it was able to, well, first of all, how it was able to create it in the first place, and then how it is able to create ascending orders of incredibly intricate complexity. Yeah. Um, and the, is, is, is mind-boggling, and, and it's really <laughs> worthy of thought. And, yeah. and when you do think about it, well, there's a chance there to rise above the everyday 
you know, problems of our lives and, and, and why you can't stand this person or is this one out to get me because he hates my kind of person or, or this or that or, or, or how come she's not paying attention to me and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and all this, you know, nerds, okay, we live in the gutter. Let's look up and see the stars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what, um, what do you wonder at? What's the thing that, that really, you every time you think about it, you go, oh, wow. Well, I, I do wonder, uh, I mean, some of these are the fundamental scientific questions. Hmm. Um, why are the laws of the universe friendly for life? Um, you know, uh, there's about 19 or 20 fundamental constants in physics. And while, for instance, th there's a reason you could come up with why, for instance, the law of gravitation should be uh, of the form of the equation that it should go as the product of the masses divided by the distance squared. There's a constant in front of that uh, called big G. And why is it that number instead of twice that or a million times that or one millionth that? And yeah. actually, it turns out that if it was more than twice that or less than half that, life would be impossible. And then there's about 19 other similar constants in all these equations. And if you change one of them by a, a fairly small amount, the, the whole universe would be impossible and, uh, or impossible to support life, put it that way, or yeah. even stars. Yeah. And yeah. the, um, so why is this? Uh, now, okay, religious people can say, well, that's how God made it. Um, but then you've got a lot of other explaining to do. Um, and, and, and so this is really a fundamental question. And then, and then how do we evolve order out of this? How do we go from atomic particles to molecules to organisms to, you know, uh, civilizations? And, 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 and um, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's really something, I mean, we, we have, uh, we don't really understand, I mean, it, it, you can come up with fast answers, yeah. um, you know, I mean, I do think, you know, for instance, the theory of evolution is in general, the uh, correct form of the theory, but when you actually get into it and the complexities that need to be involved in order for anything like a, a human being to exist, uh, it's phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, even a single cell is a phenomenal yeah. level of complexity, let alone a trillion of them working together to create a cooperative organism and, and, and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot there to be discovered. <laughs> and the first step of the discovery is looking at what there is, and then trying to think, how can we explain this? Yes. Okay. One of my uh, favorite lines that often uh, gets quizzed looks is that we we can figure the cosmos, but we can't quite understand how a mouse works. Yeah. Exactly. And it, it's true, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's a... Right. Well, except that if you don't know how a mouse works, you don't know the cosmos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, if you don't mind, I've got a couple of questions for you from our, okay. from our listeners. Uh, are you okay for time? Uh, say another 15 minutes. Uh, that's fine. I'll be more than enough. So I've got a question here from uh, a chap called David Clark. And he says, if the human race can't make a success of living on this beautiful and richly diverse planet, what makes you think that we stand a chance on a, a barren lump of rock like Mars? Well, you know, I actually think that we have been fairly successful uh, on this planet. Um, you know, uh, My father, who was born in 1916, saw his mother die when he was three, right. and his father die of something else when he was 12. And a thousand men die within a few seconds on the Pacific beach when he was 28. Yeah. And, um, and yet, so that was the world he grew up in. Um, he knew his parents for a combined between the two of them, 14 years. Goodness. I knew mine together for more their years together for more than a century. Mm. Um, okay. Um, Lovely. My military service was engineering work. Uh, mm. Never was in combat. 
Mm -hmm. um, the the uh, and, and I wasn't in the formal military. I was a contractor that supported the military. Um, you know, he he had to work his way through high school selling newspapers. I have a PhD. Yes. Um, and you know, I think all of us have had lives that are much better than those in general of our parents' generation. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, when I was a little boy, my parents would tell me to finish eating my breakfast because there were children hungry in Europe. Europe. Yes. Um, and now, you know, I mean, 10 years later, parents were telling us that they're hungry in India or China. And now it's just Africa. Um, that the, 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 you know, people don't die of hunger in the United States or Europe anymore, or even in China. And the, 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 the so we're progressing. And, you know, in, um, you know, 1959, there was a movie made called On the Beach, which seemed like a very realistic movie about humanity going extinct in a few years due to a nuclear exchange, yes. uh, which we were all expecting to happen, you know, if not this year, then certainly within two or three years. I mean, um, and, and, you know, and there were, you know, hundreds of divisions lined up along the Elbe, armed with tens of thousands of nuclear weapons pointing at each other. Yes. And, you know, okay, so we still have friction with Russia and so forth. But we don't have that. And yeah. uh, so we, we are progressing. And um, things are getting better. Mm -hmm. Things are getting much better. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, yeah, no, I, I have a positive view of humanity. Yeah, we can sometimes go insane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's true. Uh, we did in 1914. Things then were better than they ever been before. And we decided to tear the place up. But the... the um, uh, but overall, I have a positive picture, and I think we can make a still better world on Mars because we'll have a chance for a new start where we can leave as much of the worst behind and try yeah. to bring as much of the best. Well, that, that actually links to the next question, Robert. It's from Paul Crick, and he asks, what principles would or should the Constitution of Mars contain based on the lessons learned from history to date? I mean, you could probably write a book about this, but uh, it's a huge question again. But what do you think are the principles? Well, um, you know, there's nothing more valuable than the chance for a new start. Mm. And, you know, in Elizabethan England, there's a group of people around Richard Hacklett and Walter Raleigh and uh, Queen Elizabeth I, uh, who they had this group called the New World Society. And mm. they thought they could go to the New World, we'll have a New England. Uh, where we will try to bring as much of the best and leave behind as much of the worst mm -hmm. as we can. And, and and certainly they were not successful in creating utopia, but the um, but nevertheless, look, while we certainly have a class systems in the United States, we've never had blood royalty. Uh, we've had religious prejudice, but never religious persecution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and so on. So we did take a step forward, and and they then you know they had a chance to institute um, most of the ideas of 18th century liberalism, which were of course well known in Europe, but it couldn't be implemented there because there was too much entrenched power associated with older systems. And mm -hmm. we had a chance to do the noble experiment and the parts of it that worked got copied and, 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 and set a new standard. And, and I think we go to Mars, we can try to leave as much of the crap behind and, and, and start afresh and, uh, you know, try new things. If I could ask one final question then, um, and it is linked to back to Mars, we're completing the circle really. And, and obviously in the media and on the television, everywhere you look is Elon Musk. And mm -hmm his plans for Mars. Uh, do you think, and this might be a difficult question for you to answer, so forgive me if it's too difficult, but uh, is, is it right that it's that sort of commercial uh, organization that's taking us to Mars? Or 
um, could it be done a better way or how, how do you feel about it? Well, uh, look, certainly uh, Musk has, has done a profound thing. He's demonstrated that it's possible for a well-led entrepreneurial organization to do things that previously was thought that only the governments and major powers could do and be out. And he's done it, shown that it could be done at one third the time, at one tenth the cost, and even do things that they had just deemed impossible. Yeah. So the creative potential of these sorts of organizations is extremely important. And I talk about it a lot in the book. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not just Musk. He has set off a wave. And this wave, by the way, is, is not only going through the space industry, it's going into other areas, for instance, fusion power. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's now, uh, and I talk about this in the book as well, uh, seven or eight fusion power startups that are getting serious private investment. Yes. Because money people looked at what Musk did and they said, well, maybe the problem with fusion power is the same as the problem with cheap space launch. Maybe it isn't just, uh, uh, maybe it isn't primarily a technical problem. Maybe it's mostly an institutional problem. It's the wrong kind of people, wrong kind of places doing it. And, yes. and you even have one of these uh, fusion power startups in the UK, uh, the Tokamak uh, um, uh, Sciences, I think it's called. Um, and um, and they're moving much faster than the official program. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so now I think that uh, the first human bases on Mars will have a significant government component. Uh, component. I, I, I think, for instance, the Starship is flying people to orbit regularly, say by 2024, when we have our next election. Um, whoever's elected is going to turn to his or her science advisors and say, look at this, can we have people on Mars by the end of my second term? The answer is absolutely. Right. And, and is it going to cost hundreds of billions? No, tens of billions, maybe 10. Let's do it. In other words, by making this doable, it's going to make it sellable. And then I think we'll meet them halfway. Yeah. Uh, now, in terms of what then evolves on Mars, really, it's going to be a question of what works. Yes. Uh, it's the principle of evolution. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of different things are going to be tried. There'll be government control bases, corporate control bases, bases controlled by religious groups, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the various forms of societies that form based on the belief that this is something important to do for transcendental purposes. Mm -hmm. um, who knows? But mm -hmm. the forms that work, the four, and, and in particular, that offer people a chance to more fully realize their human potential than previous forms of society on earth, they will attract immigrants, they will grow, they will prosper, and they'll become examples, not only to the other societies on Mars, but to everyone on earth. Robert, you have given us so many things to think about. Thank you very, very much. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you, sir. Uh, my name is Scott MacArthur, Creative Director of the Whole Man Academy, and my guest today has been the wonderful Robert Zubin. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you, Scott.